reading from the second letter of St. John. Chosen lady, I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. But now, lady, I ask you, not as though I were writing a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning. Let us love one another, for this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, as you heard from the beginning, in which you should walk. Many deceivers have gone out into the world. Those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh, such as the deceitful one and the Antichrist. Look to yourselves that you do not lose what we worked for, but may receive a full recompense. Anyone who is so progressive as not to remain in the teaching of, of the Christ does not have God. Whoever remains in the teaching has the Father and the Son. Verbum Domini. Blessed are they who follow the law of the Lord. Blessed are they whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they who observe his decrees, who seek him with all their heart. With all my heart, I seek you. Let me not stray from your commands. <clears throat> Within my heart, I treasure your promise that I may not sin against you. Be good to your servant that I may live and keep your words. Open my eyes that I may consider the wonders of your law. Stand erect and raise your heads, because your redemption is at hand. Dominus Vobiscum, Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Lucam, 
Jesus said to his disciples, As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day that Noah entered the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Similarly, as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating, drinking, buying, selling, planting, building. On the day when Lot left Sodom, fire and brimstone rained from the sky to destroy them all. So it will be on the day the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, someone who is on the housetop and whose belongings are in the house must not go down to get them. And likewise, one in the field must not return to what was left behind. Remember the wife of Lot. Whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it, but whoever loses it will save it. I tell you, on that night there will be two people in one bed. One will be taken, the other left. And there will be two women grinding meal together. One will be taken, the other left. They said to him in reply, Where, Lord? He said to them, Where the body is, there also the vultures will gather. Verbum Domini. We get a reminder in the gospel today of the need for repentance and to be vigilant in our spiritual lives as we're given a reference to the final judgment. Our Lord references the example of the flood in the days of Noah and the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah in the days of Lot. And as people in both instances were unmindful of God, were caught off guard, being absorbed in their own daily activities, so it will be, our Lord says, on the day of the Son of Man. And this day of the Son of Man is revealed. So we're given a call to be prepared and to have our priorities in proper order. And it's a call not to put our trust in our possessions or the things of this world, but in God, ultimately. It's by self-denial, by losing oneself in a life for Christ, that one will save it for eternal life and eternal happiness. Our Lord then gives a couple of examples of two people doing the same thing. They're sleeping in a bed and two women grinding meal together. And in each case, he says, one will be taken, the other left. That doesn't mean that the decision about eternal life is arbitrary. Rather, it's simply stating that when our Lord does come again, and we know neither the day nor the hour, that when he comes, some will be ready, they'll be spiritually vigilant, and others will not be. It's simply stating a fact. If we are vigilant and our souls are prepared, we will be seeking God. Right? We'll have this desire to grow in our spiritual lives, and our prayer, our union with God. We'll be striving to grow in holiness and virtue. And if we're not, we'll see the spiritual life, a life of prayer, as being burdensome, as holding us back from what we want to do. So a key point from today's gospel is we need to be vigilant regarding how we are living our lives and to be prepared spiritually for the Lord and his coming. And today we also celebrate the memorial of St. Martin of Tours, which is also the day that we honor and pray for all our veterans on this anniversary of the end of World War I in 1918. And it's very fitting as St. Martin is the patron saint of soldiers. So we ask his intercession for us today. He was born in Hungary in the fourth century and his father was a pagan officer in the Roman army. Martin became a catechumen at the age of 10, and he entered the army himself when he was just 15 years old. One of the most well-known scenes from his life is when he encountered a beggar who was shivering in the wintry cold weather. And as his biographer noted, Martin understood from the fact that no one else had pity, because many others had passed by this beggar, that because no one else had pity on him, this beggar had been reserved for him. It was in God's providence that, he'd have, that he would have this encounter. He had nothing to give him but the cape that he was wearing. And so, because it was freezing, he took out his sword, he cut his cloak in half, and he gave 
half of his cape to this beggar. And some of the bystanders who were there laughed at him because he looked ridiculous with half a, a half a cape. But he persevered. He just kept, he knew this is what God was calling him to do. So while some laughed at him, others were cut to the heart by simply witnessing this because they knew they had more that they could have given. They didn't have to cut their cloak. They had things that they could actually give this man who was begging, who was freezing. But the following night, after Martin had gone to sleep, Christ had appeared to him, and the Lord said to him, Martin, who is still a catechumen, covered me with his cloak. And so we're quickly reminded of Matthew 25, right, when the Lord says, as you did it to the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Not long after this event, Martin was baptized. And he was sensing around this time, too, that the Lord was calling him to give his entire self to the Lord. He went to give himself entirely to the Lord, and at the same time, he's still serving actively in the army. So on one occasion, while still a soldier, bonuses were being given to the soldiers in the army, and each of them were being called up by name, and Martin was called up. At that point, Martin said to his commanding officer, up till now, I have fought for you. Allow me now to fight for God. I am a soldier of Christ. This made his superior furious, and he accused Martin on the spot in front of the others of being a coward because they were going into battle the very next day. But Martin stood up, and he said to his commanding officer, he responded, if you ascribe this to cowardice rather than to faith, Tomorrow I will stand unarmed before the front lines, with neither shield nor helmet, but with the sign of the cross to protect me. In the name of the Lord Jesus, I will push my way into the enemy's formations without being harmed. So Martin was then ordered to be kept in custody um, because the officer wanted to hold him accountable for this. And the very next day, providentially, the opposing army sent envoys to ask for peace. They had surrendered. Um, so we see in God's providence, again, that the Lord was protecting Martin uh, in this and, and really rewarding him for his great faith, his trust in God's providence and his protection. But it was shortly after this that Martin did leave the military, and he went to St. Hilary, who was the bishop of Poitiers. And under his instruction, Martin would be further formed in the faith. And at one point, and we hear oftentimes, we hear this in Scripture and through the lives of the saints, that the Lord speaks to the saints and others at times in their sleep. And Martin was inspired in a dream to get up and to go visit his native country, um, his native land, and even visit his parents, who were still pagans at the time. And as he was journeying back to visit them, he encountered robbers. And he was about to be killed by one of them, and another robber had actually stayed the hand of the man whose axe was about to come down on Martin. And this man tied up Martin and took him aside, and he was curious about him. He asked him who he was. He said, I'm a Christian. And perhaps what struck the robber even more so was that he knew that there was no fear in Martin, even though he almost had been killed right there. So he asked him about this. And Martin told him that he had never felt so safe because he knew that the Lord's mercy was closest at hand when one was in danger. Instead, the, his Martin's biographer says, instead Martin felt sorry for this man and the others because they were acting in a way that was unworthy of God's mercy. Again, he was completely confident in the trust and having great trust in Almighty God and in his mercy, his providence. So after sharing the gospel with this robber, he experienced conversion on the spot, and he begged Martin to pray for him. And then he set Martin on the right path to go back home and to visit his home country. But Martin would later be ordained to the priesthood and consecrated as a bishop. And he would establish many monasteries. And he himself lived in a monastery. He lived a holy life with about 80 other monks. He still had to fight the faith, for the faith, though. And he put a lot of hard work into um, combating heresy and errors against the faith. He worked hard to clarify the true faith as it had been passed down by Christ and the apostles. And on one occasion, he had torn down a pagan temple in a village, and he then proceeded to attempt to cut down a pine tree, which these pagans were worshiping, falsely, of course, and Martin tried to make it clear to them that there is nothing sacred about a tree stump, but rather that they should follow the one true God, and he was a servant of the one true God. 
He tried to warn them about the danger of worshiping a tree consecrated to a demon, not to the true God. Then one of the pagans boldly challenged Martin. He said, if you have any faith in your God whom you claim to worship, we will cut down this tree ourselves, and you must catch it as it falls. And if your Lord is with you as you claim, you will escape injury. So Martin, again, once again, equipped with a bold faith in God, accepted this challenge, and he stood in the path of this big pine tree as it was being chopped down. And as the tree was coming down in his direction over him, he made the sign of the cross over it. And as one translation of the account has it, you would have thought it would have been pushed back by some kind of whirlwind. And his biographer says, it was generally agreed that on that day, salvation came to that region, for there was hardly anyone in that huge crowd of pagans who did not ask for the laying on of hands and who did not believe in the Lord Jesus abandoning the error of impiety. So a miracle they had witnessed right in their midst. And it makes me, it made me think when I read that too, of the encounter of Zacchaeus, when he experienced the Lord and he had a conversion on the spot. Our Lord says, today salvation has come to this house. As the biographer said, today salvation has come to that region. Many of the pagans were converted on the spot. And they saw the power of prayer and the power of faith in the one true God. But St. Martin persevered to the end in faithfulness to Christ, and he led many others to him. As he laid on his back, suffering on his deathbed, those around him wanted to turn him around to alleviate his pain. But he responded, Allow me, brothers, to look toward heaven rather than at the earth, so that my spirit may set on the right course when the time comes for me to go on my journey to the Lord. He wanted to be set in the right direction. What a good witness and reminder with these words to keep our eyes fixed on Christ and on heaven. And it's noted that after St. Martin said these words on his deathbed, he saw the devil standing right next to him. And he responded to the devil, why do you stand there, you bloodthirsty brute, murderer? You will not have me for your prey. Abraham is welcoming me into his embrace. And with these words, he died. And witnesses recounted that St. Martin had a kind of heavenly happiness and a glow in his countenance after his death, as if he were surrounded by a light of glory. And he certainly had experienced the peace and the joy of being faithful to Christ despite the sufferings and the trials that came his way. And so we ask his intercession that we might likewise be faithful soldiers for Christ in the spiritual life, knowing that there are many obstacles um, that we need to persevere through. St. Martin, pray for us and for all soldiers and veterans, living and deceased.